Chat256 is the best asset protection mechanism there is. Yes, your money are in cyberspace. You are not there yet. You're right here in a physical presence. If you want to protect your family, you want to be able to have a plan B, a second home in case of emergency. Bitcoin is one of the main flags in the flat theory. They hope to never have to use it, but they just sleep better at night knowing that civil unrest comes in, geopolitical bullshit happens that involves their country. They're out and they have a place a safe place for the family. Americans, Canadians, Europeans are interested in Turkey because it's outside of the EU. It doesn't share all the information on the citizen with whoever needed. My definition of flag theory is basically to limit your dependency on any one particular state while obtaining a second, third, and fourth flag. Portugal is interesting for Bitcoiners specifically because they have this investment option where you invest in a fund. The fund basically just holds Bitcoin ETFs and you get red golden visa first and then apply for citizenship. So you can get a Portugal citizenship while holding Bitcoin. There is a new trend right now in the US and Canada to move to Latin America with remote jobs. They just realized their salary will give them an amazing lifestyle, let's say in Mexico, which is just three hours flight from their hometown. IRS is not the only one. Basically, every three-letter agency can revoke your passports. Now, countries do realize that they have to actually compete for the citizens, not specifically for citizens themselves, but for the capital and for the fruits of our labor. It's an interesting topic, and I think a topic that gets gets more and more uh, popular. Um, it's about Plan B and passports. First of all, like what what is Plan B? Because I actually didn't knew that like half a year ago. So maybe a lot of people are also like, what, what's Plan B, and why should we get a Plan B? Yeah, originally I was an immigrant myself, and once I moved to the United States, I realized that. Having a second passport or second residency really benefits me in a way that I now have optionality to which passport to use in which situation. So having optionality is always about freedom. Having a second option, having an insurance policy, a hedge against your main government homeland, um, that's what the plan B is. So plan B passport is a company I founded five years ago where we help Bitcoiners all over the world to obtain a second citizenship or second residency for their benefits. I basically build this com company on the concept of flag theory. And my definition of flag theory is basically to limit your dependency on any one particular state why, while obtaining a second, third, and fourth flags, right? And by flags, I mean, citizenship, residency, driver license, sometimes bank accounts, sometimes legal entity. The, the flags can be different. Um, it's like a custom tailored security model called flag theory. Ah, really interesting. Because of Bitcoin podcast, I want to have like in the beginning one Bitcoin question that is kind of getting into that. I feel like Bitcoin makes a lot of things easier for people to move around in the world and makes a little bit more, brings a more sovereignty to your life. Does Bitcoin then make Plan B a little bit less relevant for, for people that are in Bitcoin because they have uh, the option to like move around better? Yeah, Bitcoin definitely has changed the game of jurisdictional arbitrage, the game of flag theory much easier, right? Most of the flag theory stuff used like 30 years back was done for the sake of asset protection, right? So we have this structures to protect our assets where we create a trust the trust is created by three legal entities on an offshore island Th those offshore um, legal entities now hold some assets in the local bank but now we have a way better asset protection mechanism 12 words right here and it's like SHA-256 is the best asset protection mechanism there is so of course it changed the game a lot I think Bitcoin is one of the main flags in the flag theory um, toolbox right now. But I still see the necessity and the need for like, I mean, yes, your money are in cyberspace. You are not there yet. <laughs> You're right here in a physical presence. And if you want to protect your family, um, you want to be able to have a plan B, a second, second home in case of emergency that's where physical plan B comes into place. And of course, like not many people are willing to relocate away from their home country 
they do get the second citizenship and residency. And for them, it's truly a plan B. They hope to never have to use it, but they just sleep better at night knowing that civil unrest comes in, geopolitical bullshit happens that involves their country. They're out and they have a place, a safe place for the family. On the other hand, there are a lot of people who already feel like their home country jurisdiction is not does not suit them well. So they think that either the local government is going a little crazy, culturally they don't feel like they fit. So they're looking for actual relocation, and obviously we help with that too. Uh, we see what Bitcoiners want, and we provide the services that they desire. So um, that's what we do. Is there something, is the main reason asset protection, as you said, but the second reason, as you said, like there's some craziness in, in your own country and your jurisdiction going on, uh, basically the fear of maybe civil war, the fear of some crazy laws uh, of, of something, some monitoring laws or something like that. Uh, is, is that the, the main reason why, why people want that? Or maybe even like also like tax advantages or other things like are, are there other uh, things to consider? Yeah, so all the things you mentioned are very common. Now, again, flat theory is a security model. And just like with every security model, it's custom tailored. Like when it comes to Bitcoin security, like Michael Saylor has somebody custodying their coins because that's what suits him. If you ask me, it's a terrible way to do that for my family or for anybody else, right? We are the self-custody advocates. Now, when it comes to self-custody, you can have a hardware wallet, you can have a, a seed plate. And like, there's so many options and you have to find the one that suits you best based on things like, okay, how do I figure out inheritance? Uh, I need to make sure my family can have the coins if I die. I need to make sure that I can travel to 30 countries in the next year and not lose my keys. You know, like depending on your goals and needs, you will navigate what security system needs to be in place. Same goes for flat theory, right? Depending on, okay, are you a single dude? Um, who got into Bitcoin early and that's like, that's your attack vector, right? You, like you think this is where the fear should be. So based on your attack vectors and your needs, you figure out what suits you. Now, let's say you family with six kids and you're really not planning to relocate, but you need to make sure that it's, if something happens, you get out. It's a completely different thing. Um, so Yes, tax, like decreasing the capital gains tax that you know will happen in the future is one thing. Some people come with very weak passports. So let's say South African passport, extremely weak. You can't travel anywhere. You can go to Europe. You can go to the States, not all of Latin America. So you just want a, a stronger document. So you get a document that has visa-free access to 150 countries. Um, the safety issue, again, let's talk about South Africa. People are just running out of there due to safety concerns. In that scenario, you're just choosing the country whose lifestyle suits you and your family and trying to get your residency or citizenship there. So depending on goals and needs, there are different solutions. Um, but yeah, taxes, plan B, um, family security, full-on relocation for opportunities, um, cultural need, like right now, cultural need, but I mean, a bunch of Bitcoiners want to move to El Salvador because El Salvador is into Bitcoin. So that's one thing as well. How, how do you require another residency or another legal status somewhere? Yeah. So there are multiple ways in which you can obtain citizenship or residency. When it comes to citizenship, let's talk about the biggest one. So citizenship by investment, that's our specialty. That will be coiners want. They want, they don't want to relocate. They just want to invest or donate money to the state, never visit the country, get their passport. They're all set. Easy, straightforward. In eight months, you have the passport. Uh, the paperwork is, we take care of all the paperwork. So not much on you. Second option, let's say you have um, roots, ancestors from somewhere, right? That. That is very relevant for Americans. They, most of them, like half of them have European roots. So they're like, okay, my grandpa was born in Ireland. I'm going to get an Irish passport or my mom is from Spain and something like this. That's the second one. Um, it's called citizenship by descent. We provide those services as well. The third way is through naturalization. 
you actually obtain a residency through one of the ways. It could be marrying a local, getting a job in the country. There's also sol uh, financial solvency programs where you basically say, hey, I make money abroad. I make enough money to cover all my expenses in the country. And they have usually a certain threshold based on which you are able to obtain the residency. So you get a residency, you live there for five years, you get the citizenship. So those are basically the three common ways of obtaining a citizenship, a.k.a. passport of another country. With residency, as I mentioned, there are so many ways. Every country has different immigration policies, um, starting from like being a student, starting a business, getting employed, marrying a local citizen, financial solvency, investing in real estate, all kinds of things. Different, pro different countries, different jurisdictions, different uh, immigration programs. And again, that's where we come into play. You let us know where you want to go. We probably already sent somebody there before. I had, I had a lot of interesting questions for me in there. Um, maybe let's go first in like, where do the most people want to go? And like, why? Like, what, what are the, like the top destinations where people really like, obviously, uh, Bitcoin is, <laughs> nowadays want to go to El Salvador. But like, in, in general, like, what are some of the, the top places? Yeah, definitely Caribbean islands, offshore Caribbean jurisdictions are still top of the citizenship by investment uh, offerings because under a year processing, you don't have to visit the island. You don't have to live on the island. The process is very straightforward. The program has been around for decades. And all you do is you donate $200,000 to the local government or you buy some bonds or you buy some real estate on the island. And on this basis, you obtain citizenship. The paperwork, the due diligence is very thorough. Like they go through all your shit quite <laughs> diligently. Um, but it's like those programs are well known. The passport is very powerful. The islands have zero capital gains tax, zero global income tax. Um, you apply remotely and the majority of the funds you pay at the very end when you already know that you got approved, let's say. So it's like a safe bet. Everybody's like... Thousands of people done it before. Those passports work. Uh, the programs are like everybody knows of those programs. So they, they, they've gone through the time to prove themselves. Let's say that. Uh, that would be top one. Then we have, uh, let's say, Turkey. And the reason people want Turkey is because usually Turkey is on the other side of political spectrum from where they are. So if you think that your country is going downhill... You want to see, you want to get a passport from a country that is clearly not in bed with your home state government, because then they're culturally the same uh, in terms of governmental opinion and the direction they go to probably the same. So Americans, Canadians, Europeans are interested in Turkey because it's outside of the EU. It doesn't share all the information on the citizen with whoever, <laughs> with whoever needed. So Turkey is also interesting because the citizenship. Um, is obtained based on real estate investment. So you buy a two, three bedroom apartment, you get citizenship in a seven months period. And three years later, you can sell that real estate. Usually the real estate does pretty well. I mean, compared to Bitcoin, probably not, but compared to fiat, probably yes. Um, so Turkey would be another one. And now Portugal um, is interesting for Bitcoiners specifically because they have this investment option where you invest in a fund, the fund basically just holds Bitcoin ETF. So you give up self-custody, but you still have price exposure and you get red golden visa first and then apply for citizenship. So you can get a Port Portugal citizenship while quote unquote holding Bitcoin. That's interesting. Uh, that's, yeah. that's like the, probably the, the closest thing that Bitcoiners want. They, they want exposure to Bitcoin. <laughs> exactly. And then, of course, we have El Salvador. El Salvador has interesting programs in place right now, specifically catered to our audience because we are the ones moving there. So um, I'm I'm pretty bullish in El Salvador. It's really interesting. It's also um, it's something that seems to be quite expensive when we talk about two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand uh, uh, investments. Is is there? Is, is there a possibility for someone that is like barely scraping by and like can save a little bit of money? And what are the options of, of someone like can relocate in, in an area 
uh where like i don't know he he lives somewhere and he wants to relocate some uh, somewhere else um what are the options for him there is a new trend right now in the us and canada to move to latin america with remote jobs so those people live paycheck to paycheck but they make money in us dollars now they move to latin america and they spend money in pesos uh and the light like the dollar goes way further down there so They don't have savings. They just leave paycheck to paycheck. But because of the, I mean, difference in the salaries between jurisdictions, it's again, it, it's a play of jurisdictional arbitrage in a way too. Um, they just realize their salary will give them an amazing lifestyle, let's say in Mexico, which is just three hours flight from their hometown. But now they can live in a penthouse and, and eat out every day and still make some savings. So that's always an option. And yeah, I specifically talk about citizenship by investment, let's say. Um, you give up 200K, but um, you do it because you don't want to relocate. You don't want any of this five-year wait period. You just want to have a passport by the end of the year. And that's what you buy. That's why people are willing to do that. Is that possible for everyone like no matter what, what passport they they have uh, depending on like they don't have any criminal records they're like normal person yeah. that they are not like edward snow or something like that they they just like uh, if they had a, have the money they can do it there are some countries that are currently banned in certain jurisdictions certain programs for example with citizenship by uh, citizenship by investment in the caribbean russia is currently banned um also i believe Iran, Iraq, North Korea, maybe Cuba, from the top of my head, I don't remember. But yeah, there are some jurisdictions that currently cannot apply. Um, but yeah, based, like, usually the client comes to me and I look into where they're coming from, what their goals and needs are, so we can choose together the jurisdiction that will meet their goals, but also that is feasible for them. Uh, feasible in terms of price, feasible in terms of the effort they have to put in order to obtain this citizenship. Um, so that's the customization of the process. That, that seems to be a, a legit use case, actually, for, like, because, uh, like, for example, Russia is now banned. Uh, maybe in, in a few years, your country is in the future banned for, for something like that. So, like, that's like a, a really good argument for, for someone to get it before they need it. It's like, oh, yeah. with Bitcoin, you, you, you want Bitcoin before your uh, dollar is completely devalued. Like, that's an interesting argument. Exactly. Interesting point. Really, really interesting. There's also this concept of, strong and weak passports and i never thought about that before i met my you Indian must girl. have a strong passport yeah exactly yeah <laughs> I, i i never thought about that before i met my indian girlfriend mm -hmm. uh, and for her this was a, a really big topic and i have an austrian passport so like i basically can travel everywhere and i don't have to, to deal with like waiting periods and and like uh, get actually apply to travel somewhere that, that concept was so foreign for me like i never thought about that in my life uh, but that's a that's a real thing like the passports are strong and weak and it matters where you are actually coming from absolutely and i've learned it firsthand born and raised in russia i was on a russian national team and every time i had to go for like a world championship european championship we would have to send our passport to the embassy provide them with Uh, airplane tickets, hotel reservations, everything must be paid for already. Otherwise, you just won't get this visa. And I've been denied for visa so many times. Imagine a 14-year-old girl is flying to Switzerland for a Europe Cup. Like, is she a threat to the country? Probably not. Is she going to stay by herself and be an illegal immigrant at 14? Probably not. Does she have a good reason to go? Yes. And I get denied. I've been denied for visas my whole childhood. And that's probably one of the reasons I'm doing this business too, because I've seen firsthand the pain of it. Um, yeah, I usually say that my childhood really prepared me to be a Bitcoiner and a passport girl because, I mean, seeing Russian hyperinflation, having my bank account frozen, having my visas denied my whole childhood, I'm like, okay, let's go, guys. We got to solve all that. That's really interesting. Um... Maybe my case is also interesting for some people that are listening because I know that most of the people that are listening to the podcast are from the United States. 
from Canada, from the UK, from from countries that are that have quite good passports. Uh, like the, those, like most of the countries, obviously they are uh, from all around the world, but like the, the big portions are from like the, the, the uh, those countries. Um, what can, I think more, um, what, what can they, like, for me, it's also interesting for Austria, like, let's do this first. Um, I know that when I have a second passport, I probably lose my Austrian one. I think that's like a, there's like a rule towards that. What, what can we do if, if there's like, you have a passport and your country doesn't allow a second passport. Yeah. Um, so very few countries in the world actually prohibit having dual citizenship. You just got lucky. Uh, India actually would be another one. Um, so Indian citizens whose country do not allow dual citizenship, but their passport is weak, they're just willing to let it go. They usually obtain a second citizenship elsewhere they live in the US, they have a Caribbean passport, they just keep their, there's the, the special status for Indians who left India and don't have the passport anymore, that they still can come and spend a lot of time there, no problems. So they're just willing to let it go. In your case, you do have a very strong passport. And it's just this strategizing, like, if you want to leave in Austria for the rest of your life, probably just keep it and make sure you have a residency elsewhere to at least mitigate some risks. But yeah, you you can't really have dual triple citizenship. As for America, UK, Canada, you can have seven. If you watch my podcast already for more than two times, you know how extremely passionate I am about self-custody. And the first very, very, very important step to self-custody is always getting yourself a hardware wallet and i have one for you here this is the bitcoin only edition from the bitbox my favorite single signature hardware wallet on the market another really important piece of self-custody if you have a hardware wallet is the backup of the seed phrase and bitbox made the perfect solution to back up your seed phrase they made a reusable steel wallet check out that beauty it's durable and extremely heavy if i put it on the desk i seriously fear for my own table it's so so heavy and durable i love it this is where my seed phrase is secure go to bitbox.swiss slash robin to get your bitbox and if you use code robin you even get five percent off of your complete order and the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual you you have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made an perfect bitcoin watch that's the perfect subtle elegant way to go out there and show that you are a bitcoiner and that watch brand is bitcoin only and coin vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing genesis edition of their watch collections you have the date of the first ever mined bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in i love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing coin vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions i love those watches so so much and what's the difference uh residency and and citizenship because like i can get a, a second residency which means i have to have a house there or like how else to work in so residency permit is basically usually it's a residency card or something like this in most countries it residency is a permit for you to live and sometimes work in a country 
like a citizen, you still have limited rights. You can't vote usually, but you can buy real estate. You can have local bank accounts. So you can reside in a country, but you don't have a travel document that will get you across borders. This is just a permit for you to live in a country, basically. The citizenship comes with a passport, right? So now you have full citizen rights. You have a travel document of this country. Um, that's that's the biggest difference. And distinct, like, it's huge difference between residency and citizenship. Yes, residency will keep you safe in a different country in the moment you need it. But let's say you're, like, in the U.S., for example, an IRS, the tax um, tax office of the United States, can revoke your passport if you didn't pay taxes. So now you're stuck in a country. You can't leave no matter what. And it, IRS is not the only one. Basically, every three-letter agency can revoke your passport. So in case of civil unrest in the country, they're probably going to close the borders, revoke, like, say, everybody's American passport does not have a power, you can't leave. So in this scenario, you want to have another passport that you can just use at the border and get the fuck out. So, so yeah, that that's can, a big difference. So you cannot do that with residency. You can get, cannot get yeah. across borders, yeah? Exactly. So you still need the, the Austrian passports to, to get like a... And this was my, my situation because I really was looking into that like the last few months and I was like, uh, oh, I, I would like to get like uh, in the future maybe a second passport. I, f I feel comfortable in Austria. Uh, but giving up the home Austrian uh, passport is a big thing. Uh, and especially if it's a, already a good one and like yep. you, you kind of have a you kind of have to make a downgrade for that. I'm pretty sure like in Europe, they started to allow more and more dual citizenship. Like Germany was the big one before, but now they have exceptions. So the EU starting to move towards, okay, dual citizenship is fine. Very interesting. So maybe in 10 years. I hope, I hope. <laughs> Yeah. I'm, I'm young. I'm 25. I was a lot of flying oh, in front yeah, of me. I hope, awesome. I hope. I hope so. Um, uh, let's talk about uh, Bitcoin. When, when did it make uh, sense for you? You talked about before that in, you had inflation uh, in, when you were in Russia already. So like you were prepped, uh, prepped for being uh, someone in Bitcoin. When did you make? Uh, when made it click for you? So philosophically, I feel like most Russians are prepared to be Bitcoiners. Like. They understand the radical ownership that is necessary for an asset because their assets has been seized before. They understand inflation very well because we had a couple of hyperinflations in the last 20 years. We just seen our currency lose 50% of value when the war, Russian Ukrainian war, started. So we understand it very well. Now it's only the matter of learning enough about Bitcoin to realize it is the solution. So for me, um, it was just very coincidental. I was in the right place at the right time. Um, and I just, I was learning English, just moved to the United States. It's 2017. I'm going to every meetup possible. And I'm starting to happen to be at like Bitcoin meetups and some small conferences around. Um, and at some point it just clicked. Like it all, it sounded good right away because people called it freedom money. And I was like, okay explain me more and the first book i've read was antonopoulos mastering bitcoin which was extremely hard for me it was in a foreign language i barely spoke english back then uh, it was also pretty technical we didn't have the we didn't have um the bitcoin standard yes yet which is more into like economics and philosophy we had mastering bitcoin which is bob sends alice this is the hash this is and you're like okay guys but it did click at some point. And of course, it's like a process of thousands of clicks because you feel like you understand Bitcoin and then another psh moment happens. You're like, whoa, it's even cooler than I thought. Um, but yeah, it, I was just prepared to be a Bitcoin and it was only a matter of time until I figure it out. How do you see the, the the future of all that? It's like citizenships are, are, are easier and easier to, to get when we get more and more the, the possibility to travel around the world seems to be more connected now with money we have a really nice device for just like using as a bank account and you can literally go every, in every country and exchange your bitcoin for local currency and buy everything you want do we need in the, in the is, is there a possibility that we can just like live on earth and and we we really are free and we can just move around more and those those 
those those kind of artificial borders and this artificial um, uh, barriers are not there as as much. Yeah, um, if you read Sovereign Individual book, it talks a lot about the end of nation states, specifically through this concept of um, competition between nation, nation states. So it used to be that you're born in a single country, the country has monopoly over you because you only have one passport. You're also attached to local jobs, um, you are limited by the language, so mostly you, you would be born and stayed in the same country for the rest of your life. Even 15 years ago, only 3% of people around the world would live in a country that they were not born in, which means it's crazy. It's only 3%, meaning that 97% monopoly over you. So if we look into what happened through COVID, people realize that they're no longer attached to their jobs locally. They can pick up their things, go anywhere and work remotely. That was a really big thing. Uh, the, the nomadism, right? The digital nomad concept. That was a big spike in that. And now countries do realize that they have to actually compete for the citizens, not specifically for citizens itself, but for the capital and for the fruits of our labor. So now if we can pick and choose which state provider we want to use, where we want to live, they will have to compete for our attention. So how do they compete? With taxes, with cultural um, movements, right? So like El Salvador just said, no income tax for any tech company in a, in a country. That's a huge incentive for tech founders to go and start their businesses there, right? So they will have to incentivize us to bring the fruits of our labor and our capital into the country. And just like that, we have this beautiful dynamic of, I mean, free market competition between nation states. And just like in every free market, there are two uh, forces, basically the price race to the bottom and the quality race to the top. And I've been, I've been doing it for last over five years now. And I've been thinking about it. And I realized that maybe I had a little too much hope you know, thinking that we would be moving in this direction faster. And there are definitely, um, they, they put, they put blockers into our wheels here and there. They, they do try to limit the way we can move with exit tax in the United States with prohibiting dual citizenship in Austria. So all these tools are still in place, but they, at some point they will realize that they can't stop the free market. So I have hope about it. I'm seeing some trends, some of them towards this beautiful future, some of them going in the other direction, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I just want to have this free market where people can pick and choose the country. But, but in general, you see uh, the competitive programs between those nation states increasing in the, in the last years. From the countries that have... Okay, let's say we're talking about the United States. They are a really big, big magnet of talent. Austria is actually too, is too. Um, they import a lot of talent, right? But they usually don't really, like, they still think they're the shit and they think it's going to be forever and people will never leave, but they do leave and they start living. And America has been seeing like exponential increase in the amount of people who actually renounce their U.S. citizenship, get rid of their American passport because of the taxes, the, the politics, the culture. But the countries that, like El Salvador, they had to make Bitcoin a legal tender. They were at the bottom of the cantillion effect. The money were printed in the U.S. By the time they get to El Salvador, like it's all devalued. So they had this need to change things. And those are going to be the countries who lead that. Um, like Portugal, not the, not the wealthiest country in Europe, is doing this golden visa thing where they really do try to bring foreign capital. It is not available for EU citizens, but meaning that they are bringing capital into EU from mostly Canada, US, and Russia probably at this point. Um, so the countries that are not at the top of the power dynamic game they are the ones who are going to be leading that they do have to be courageous because for example caribbean islands who have really great citizenship by investment program they're constantly getting hit by eu that 
EU doesn't like their programs because it does give new citizens a visa-free access to the EU, so they want to have a say. Um, but those countries need to be able to push back, need to let the EU know that they're not God and they shouldn't play one. Um, and that's what El Salvador is showing, showing the way to others. They're being extremely courageous. They're saying, fuck you to everybody, and they're not afraid of that. So that's beautiful to see. Yeah, I, I think it's also really, really beautiful. It's also uh, interesting because I think we are at a starting point of, of uh, all that journey. Uh, we needed the internet for that, uh, to be able to work from everywhere. Uh, because like f for me, the, the whole topic was arising once I got my income now from, from online, from podcasting, from all those things. Then I was like, oh, like my, my job is no longer in Austria. Like I, I can pack up my things and be anywhere I want. Uh, so that was the first thing that even triggered me in asking those questions. Uh, and second thing is like, of course, money. Uh, so like if we have those two things and they just like arise like the last like 10, 20 years, uh, basically, uh, and with remote work also, that's, that's also a big one. Uh, so like, I, I feel like we are right at the cusp of, of something starting. Like we are like, it, it's, it's slowly moving there, but The, those wheels at the nation state level they are not <laughs> moving faster I, oh. i feel like but you see the, the those the, those things that, that are great um, yeah hopium i have oh. lots of hopium for it oh, yeah we, we need that hopium uh speaking of hopium uh i want to focus a little bit also on el salvador uh, as it's a one of one of the favorite uh, countries right now for for bitcoiners it's also amazing to that we talk about el salvador right now because three, four years ago, we would probably not have talked about El Salvador at all. Uh, but but uh, uh, what are they doing and, and why is it so attractive right now, uh, even outside of you want to move there because Bitcoin is cool? Yeah. The advantage of El Salvador right now is they're a tiny country, six million people. Um, they basically operate as a startup. You know, when you compare to, when you compare 10 people startup to Microsoft, the changes can be implemented much faster in the startup. They can pivot in a day and have a completely new product rolled out. In Microsoft, it will take days and 17 project managers to move it to an actual developer, right? So same goes for El Salvador. They realize, um, they, they, they realize that they were at the bottom and they had to just jump off the bottom and make changes really quick. And that's what they started doing. Uh, so you know what they've done in, with the justice system and really went after gang members, put a lot of people in jail, which I don't know enough about to comment, but it seems like the country did become way safer. They used to be the most dangerous country in the world. Now they're equal to Canada and they're like top one, top two safest countries in the North America, which is like mind blowing to make that change in four years. Then they said Bitcoin is a legal tender and the country buys one Bitcoin every day. How crazy is that? They're stacking hard. On top of it, they said anybody can donate $1 million to El Salvador in Bitcoin and become a citizen of the country. So they do have the citizenship by investment program that is more expensive than any other CBI in the world, but that's just how they position themselves. And there are people who are willing to donate $1 million in Bitcoin to have their citizenship to be part of that country and to support this country's um, changes, reforms. Now, on top of that, they are trying to educate local citizens, citizens about Bitcoin. They're investing a lot in advertising the um, traveling in the country. I've been seeing influencers on Instagram go to El Salvador and talk about how amazing the land is They call it an hour and a half country because basically you can get anywhere in an hour and a half. So from volcano to the ocean, you can surf, uh, you can eat pupusas, whatever you call it. So um, they're working on that. And now they're installing an, like, an interesting tax regime for those who bring jobs, who bring capital, who bring innovations into the country. Four months ago, the president also announced that they're going to start the program for talent. They're going to import talent and give citizenships to those who are like extremely extraordinary experts in their industries. Um, so that's an amazing program as well. 
Um, so they just implement the changes so quickly that they attract more and more people. Um, the changes, again, there's no, the butterfly effect only has a couple stops until the country actually realizes what happens. It's not that you make a tiny change and it takes 15 years for the country to realize all that. No, you can see the change in a week and two. So um, really amazing to see all that. Huge fan. But for citizenships, you have to donate, not invest, but donate a, a million dollars. Like that's a yep. huge barrier for for, yep. for, for, for for most people. But yeah, and I guess they also you... have they have other programs. So it's not that in order to move to El Salvador, you have to donate one million. Again, the residency is really easy to obtain. Um, you can have local employment. You you can start a local business. You can just prove that you have income from abroad over $2,000 a month and you're good to stay. So the residencies are very easy to obtain. That's why a lot of Bitcoiners just moving there, getting their residency cards, settling down in a country. Mm, okay. So like, it would be very easy for me to, 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 to move very there. Like, okay. Really yeah. cool. Really cool. Perfect. And uh, this was uh, really informative already. Um, I asked you that because uh, um, I asked you that before the, the podcast, but I will ask you uh, specific, specifically now, did I, end, did I miss anything on that topic? Did I uh, miss any question or any topic that, that would be good to know for the audience? No, we actually did cover a lot uh, what I usually want to cover for those looking into Plan B Passport. Again, just want to mention it's a custom tailored process. Um, if I didn't mention certain countries that you're interested in, I probably know their immigration policy can advise you what could work for you. Um, we have a free consultancy call and that basically me brainstorming with Bitcoiners on what would suit them best. Feel free to get it on our website. Let's, let's think together. Really cool. Perfect. Um, my end routine is always two questions. The first question is always the same question for each guest. Uh, and the question is, what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin and plan B? Well, I'm a mother. I'm very proud of it. <laughs> um, so anything about motherhood, I really like to share. Um, also, I'm, I'm doing a little like some call it radical motherhood or like alternative ways. Like I birth children at home. I... I start, start them on solids, meaning like introducing them to food in a very different way. Um, so I, I like to talk about it with Bitcoiners because I feel we're like, we're aligned. Like instead of giving them smashed fruit as their first food, I give them steak because why not? And that's been actually working out quite well for us. Um, I had my baby right here where I'm currently sitting. So at home, I had a little pool here. So anything about motherhood, um, I would love to talk about. I love to see that so many Bitcoiners are just parents and, and they love parents. Like that that question um, brings up a lot family uh, and motherhood and parenthood in, in general. Like that's that's uh, amazing to see that that it's such a, a great and huge topic. Like that it's, it's really, I think it's very healthy for the community to, to, to see that aspect uh, of, of life so many Absolutely. times mentioned. Uh, I highly recommend 10 out of 10 become a parent. Get babies chat guys. Yeah. <laughs> really cool. Success make babies. Uh, that, that's, that's great. Yeah. The uh, other end routine is where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Uh, and the question for you is what would Bitcoin have the biggest impact on outside of the financial system? Well, that would be borders. <laughs> I, I, really, <laughs> I really do believe that, that it does change the dynamic between the state and individuals. Separating the state of money takes a lot of control back from them. So uh, I don't like, I mean, border is an imaginary line. And if you cross it, you have to exchange money from one to another. And then you have to have a certain piece of paper to prove that you belong on the side of an imaginary line. So this whole concept is super weird. Um, it needs to change. And I think as a global currency that is decentralized and not controlled by any government, we have a chance to make that happen. So, uh, yeah, geopolitics, let's say that. I, I love that, that you say it because they basically like um, uh, the business that you have is relying on those, those rules, but you're like, I don't want those rules. <laughs> I want to make it easy. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing the best thing 
available right now, but I wish it wasn't an issue. So you wish you wouldn't have to do that. Yeah, I, I get that a lot. It's, it's really cool. Um, thank you so much for being on, uh, uh, Katie. Um, before I let you go, where can people find you, ask your questions, the website and everything? I'm Plan B Passport on Twitter, at Plan B Passport. I have a YouTube channel where I usually, I'm very quick with the news of the industry. If something happens, you're probably going to find out first if you sign up for my YouTube. Um, and then our website, planbpassport.com, you can schedule a free call. You can just submit an application to learn more about every program. Um, so yeah, that's where you find us. Perfect. And thank you so much for joining us today. As always, uh, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. <laughs>